So uh, a lot of this is stuff I've been hammering out over the last couple days. <laughs> so we'll see where this goes. And some of it is things I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, but I'm trying to mix some things together that I've never mixed before. So you guys are all in for whatever happens. <laughs> and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the Q&A especially, because I'm really trying to think through some things. And I think we're all interested in kind of the core question I'm interested in is how do we get students to engage in what you might call deep learning rather than just strategic learning. And uh, you know, our universities are now full of strategic learners, people who are really good at getting good grades, but not necessarily uh, really invested in some sort of deep learning. So that's why the title here, The End of Wonder in the Age of Whatever, is up there. And I want to just say a little bit about the age of whatever and what I mean by that, as well as what I mean by the end of wonder. Um, so I'll start with a story. There's uh, Seymour Papert, who's this great mathematician at MIT. Uh, he started studying how children learn. And so he was in some preschools. And one day he was visiting a preschool. And one of the preschoolers found out that he grew up in South Africa. And they thought, oh, great. How, how do giraffes sleep? I've always wondered how giraffes sleep. And he didn't know. He, he couldn't remember from his own childhood in South Africa of ever seeing a giraffe sleep. He just didn't know. So uh, they're all sitting around. This is 1991 uh, at the time. So, so there is no internet. Nobody can pull out their smartphone and find out how giraffes sleep, that kind of thing. So they're all brainstorming, throwing out theories, that kind of stuff. And then later, he goes home. Um, and he's looking at his big wall of books there. And he thinks, wow, you know, I have this great advantage that I have this great wall of books. And he starts pulling books off the shelf grabs an encyclopedia, looks up giraffes, tries to find out giraffe sleep. He still couldn't figure out giraffe sleep. He just, the answer is just not available to him. So then he starts to muse a little bit. And, he, and being this great, you know, he's right on the cutting edge of technology at the time. And he realized that not too far in the future, these same four-year-olds that are at preschool will be able to use just a few hand gestures. He actually envisioned this, you know, 20 years ago, that they'd be able to use a few hand gestures and pull up pictures and videos of giraffe sleeping. And, and of course, he's right. And he called that the knowledge machine. And here it is, right? We now live in this world where there are 3 billion people, more than 3 billion people, connecting and collaborating in ways we've never connected and collaborated before. And the digital artifacts of all that collaboration creates uh, more information than, than uh, you know, we can really even conceptualize. It's just a tremendous amount of information. And if you're interested in how giraffes sleep, you can actually just pull out your phone right now. And I've, I've done it for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you will get, if you do look up giraffes, you get 56,000 YouTube videos. And if that's, you know, not deep enough for you, you can go to Google Scholar and you can get these really detailed articles about how giraffes sleep. This one describes the paradoxical sleep pattern recognized by their peculiar positioning of the head on the croup. And if you don't know what a croup is, you can go back to Google Images and do a search and you get this, these images like this. If you still don't understand that, uh, you get this image that just spells it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much, that's it, right? That's the knowledge machine. It's here. Uh, and, and, and that means something. But really, this is just the, the beginning, right? We know this is just the beginning. Because if you follow any sort of futurist or technologist who's looking at the future, they will tell you that this is going to be your five-second overview, that we're headed towards ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous communication, ubiquitous information, unlimited speed about everything, everywhere, from anywhere, on all kinds of devices. And that this now makes it ridiculously easy. This is a technical term from Seb Paquet. He, uh, he, this is a, you can actually read this in like real literature, peer-reviewed literature. <laughs> it is ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish with anybody to anybody in the world. And that means that how we are running our teaching is kind of strange. And <laughs> this is maybe the worst example. but. Um, but in fact, the whole nature of knowledge has shifted. This isn't just about information being everywhere. This is about kind of new ways of thinking about what knowledge really is and what it means to be knowledgeable. I actually think in my own terms, as I was, you know, when I think about helping students in this world, I think more, less about getting them to be knowledgeable, knowing a bunch of stuff. And I think more and more about how to get them to be knowledge able, able to find, sort, analyze, criticize, uh, and maybe even create new information and knowledge. But this transition, this idea of knowledge changing, has been around a lot longer than new, new media. And some of the changes are more fundamental and more interesting, actually, th those deeper, uh, longer-term changes. 
I was just rereading William Perry's study of, social, of student development, and in the beginning of that, he has this chart. Uh, it looks like this. This chart, what he did was he took all of the exams. This book was written in uh, 1960s, so he was doing this study in the 1950s, and he took all the exams at Harvard, and he tried to analyze whether or not the question had a simple answer that was straightforward, fact-based, that kind of thing, versus whether or not you had to take multiple perspectives in order to argue an answer, so to speak. And what he found was that over time, uh, in 1900, about 92% of questions were simple, fact-based questions. And by the 1950s, less than half of questions at Harvard were that, of that nature. And that he talks about this as a, a change, a shift to relativism is the word that he uses. But certainly we live in a world in which uh, controversy, argument, debate, and, and really trying to get beneath the surface of things is what higher ed is all about. It's not just about memorizing information. And so I'm now more interested, not just in moving students from being, from being knowledgeable to knowledge able, but ultimately to give them a sense of curiosity and wonder. And if you think about what you do, if you get students to have the sense of curiosity and wonder, then this environment in which we live drastically shifts for them. So uh, one way of framing this is this way. Uh, most students, and I, I don't even want to talk about students, let's talk about all of us, because we're all this way. We all started at some point in our lifetimes, we really saw the world in terms of right and wrong answers. And we saw everything in terms of answers and that there were authorities out there that could tell us the answers and there were, you know, we could go discover answers for ourselves, but it was all about answers and, and it seemed an unlimited supply of answers were available. And then we maybe encountered a professor somewhere along the way that we were really disturbed by who posed questions to us. And that frustrated us because it just seemed inefficient. You know, just give us the answers. Stop making us try to figure out the answers. And over time then, we, our, our world starts to expand a little bit and we start to recognize that there are real controversies in the world. Uh, but we still believe in answers and we think, you know, eventually these controversial questions will resolve themselves and uh, we'll find the answers. Only, you know, sometimes this takes until you're, you might be in graduate school or something, you start to realize that the controversies aren't just real, they're, they're never going to end. <laughs> that we live in a world of ambiguity. That there are always going to be multiple perspectives to be taken on any one problem. That every angle is going to reveal cer certain things and hide other things. And this really is the world uh, uh, I think this is really the only legitimate way to engage in the world is to recognize this ambiguity. And then the one saving grace is that we can, we can add an affirmation to that. And that's what wonder is all about. When your world expands to the point where you have this sense of wonder, where you're living with the questions and you love it. You have this joy in, in living with these questions, in sitting with ambiguity, sit, sitting with uncertainty. And that's really the great gift we could give to our students because if you think about this world of you know, ubiquitous, pervasive information, just so much information, the student who is given the gift of wonder, or, or who achieves the gift of wonder, you might say, uh, just has this amazing knowledge machine, right? But this knowledge machine only works on wonder. It only works with curiosity, only works on questions. If you don't have questions, this becomes the world's largest distraction device. And that's the, that's the fundamental difference here that we're talking about. So in my own, this is my class, <laughs> by the way. Um, so you're thinking about, okay, wonder how do we do this here? And, um, and that will be basically the, the talk of trying to figure this out. Um, but, you know, so one of the things I started doing in my class was I started really paying attention to the questions they were asking. Rather than just paying attention to how they were doing on my exams, I was like, well, what kind of questions are they asking? Are they, are they asking the types of questions that will propel them onto a lifetime of reflection and contemplation and, and, and really asking those questions that dig into your soul and, and sit with you for a long time? Now, those were the types of questions that I actually got out of this very class. I was myself an undergrad at K-State, and so I sat in this very room and had my, my world flipped upside down by a wonderful professor, and I, uh, the gift he gave me were the, the gift of these questions that burned in my soul that took me all over the world trying to answer those questions. So I wondered if, if I was getting any questions into the souls of my students, and sure enough I was. They were questions like, how many points is this worth? <laughs> how long does this 
<laughs> favorite need to be? Uh, what do we need to know of this test? You guys know these questions. Um, and these, of course, are the worst kind of questions because they are actually questions that are saying something like, I'm really busy. How much do I need to learn? I don't want to learn. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, not, these are not the wonderful questions we want. So um, what I want to talk about today is, is one, like, I want to give you a real picture of what wonder looks like. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through kind of a journey of my own that, that kind of helps me understand what it feels like to, to take that very difficult journey from a world where everything seems fixed and has, and has right and wrong answers to a world of ambiguity and then ultimately embracing that ambiguity. So I'll talk about that. Then I want to talk about why that's so hard, especially in our culture today. There are all kinds of forces working against us. And then we're going to come around at the end to, to look at spaces where wonder is flourishing, the characteristics of those spaces, and how you might be able to bring those into your classroom. So that, or for students, how you can bring those into your life. There are some basic elements, basic approaches that you can take to life that will lead ultimately to wonder. But it's a long journey. I won't lie to you. <laughs> uh, achieving a sense of wonder in your life is not at all easy. So let me tell you about my own um, journey. So my own journey, as I said, actually started here with a very standard lecture-based classroom. Uh, but it just happened to be a lecturer who was very authentic. He kind of put his own soul on the line, uh, shared himself in ways I had not ever seen before. And in, and I being, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, so this is an anthropology class, which is a study of all humans in all times, all places. So as he's talking about all humans in all times and all places, it's really expanding my mind and ultimately blowing my mind, right? And that's, that's what opened up all these questions for me. And a lot of these questions were questions I couldn't find answers to in books, and so I decided I just needed to go someplace. And I actually enrolled in graduate school mostly for the purpose of going to New Guinea. <laughs> I wasn't planning on being an anthropologist, but I did enroll in an anthropology program um, with the purpose of getting to New Guinea. So I flew into the, uh, I achieved my dream just one year into graduate school. I got this little grant, allowed me to go into New Guinea. So I fly into the capital city here. And I snapped this picture because as a small town kid from Nebraska, this seemed like a really big deal um, to me. And then I put on my backpack and I just had this, I just had this idea like I'm just going to go out and meet as many people as possible, just get to know the world. And, and so I put on my backpack and I walk out the front gate um, first morning that I was there and these, these two guys walking towards me and they say, hey, Moni. And they speak like a pigeon English there. And so in this pigeon English, hey, Moni could mean uh, good morning or it could also mean give me your money. And, um, and since I'm a small town kid from Nebraska, I immediately assume they're saying good morning. So I say, oh, morning, morning. And they say, no, God, morning, morning. And they start tapping their pockets like this. And I'm still kind of trying to play dumb. And I just smile. And I say, oh, morning, morning. And I try to step around them. And then they step in front of me. And the one guy pulls his jacket back. And he's got a machete in there. And I turn my back so that if he slashes at me, he'll just hit my backpack. And I start running. And I get around the corner, and fortunately around the corner were all the wonderful people I had hoped that I would meet. And uh, they chase these two guys off, and I walk straight to the airport. And, uh, and so I get to the airport, and then this is where I learned like, the power of questions for me. Because I did, I had all these questions about you know, the nature of being human, and I really wanted to experience how different humans could be. And so then I'm looking up at the board, you know, with all the departures. And the first one is Brisbane. And I think, oh, I'll just get a ticket to Brisbane. That would be great. You know, I could, you know, learn to surf and live in, live in Australia <laughs> for a while. Because, um, you know, I'm 22 at the time. So this just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, but then I'm looking down the list and I see all these towns that I would you know, read a bit about in some ethnographies and things that I'd read. And I realized that the answers to my questions were not going to be in Brisbane. They were going to be somewhere down that list. And so I decided to go ahead and get on a, a, a plane into the center of the island. And I just kept taking smaller plane after smaller plane after smaller plane until I was flying into this place, which was right out on the border. And there's no, no electricity, no running water. My money's not going to be any good when I land. I, I remember feeling all these things you know, as I'm flying in. Like, this is it. You know, this is, the, for me, the frontier. You know, this is like where you know, I, just, I just can't rely just on myself once I land. I'm going to have to make friends just to eat. You know, so I land, and this is my greeting, and <laughs> um, and then the uh, 
This is a place where the plane comes in once every six weeks, but that's kind of spotty. You never really know. So the plane leaves, and then I'm back here again. <laughs> and, um, and I just decide I'm going to keep walking. I just want to just see how different people can be. I'm just going to go as far as I can go. So I just start walking, and I you know, walk through beautiful landscapes like this, past villages like this. And, and, and I met this guy. Apparently, you're not supposed to be this close to these things, but I was a kid from Nebraska, so I didn't know. <laughs> and then I ended up here. Um, and I ended up, off and on, I, I kept coming back here for over a span of eight years. I lived there about two years total. Uh, so it's where I did my PhD field work. And uh, I'll just take you into this house where I lived when I first got there. Um, well, this, this is around the house here. This, they grow their own taro, sweet potato, bananas. They raise pigs. <clears throat> they eat spiders. Um, snakes are kind of a good deal because you get like a two for one thing. You, you, they usually are lazy when they, after they've eaten, so you can cut it open and you get the appetizer. And, um, and this, is, this is then like a week after I'm there. Uh, these are my legs, this is my sleeping bag. And um, we just ate the snake uh, that day, you know, and I'm looking around the hut and I realize there's all these holes everywhere. And uh, so I, I, wrap my, I wrap myself up in the sleeping bag just to protect myself from whatever might come in. And after we ate the snake, I'm especially worried because I figure, you know, that snake, it was caught just like 100 feet from where I was staying. You know, I figure it might have family. Um, I figure my, my snake karma is not good since we just ate it. <laughs> you know, I have all kinds of reasons to be worried. So I wrap myself up in the sleeping bag, but it's, you know, the tropics, so it gets hot in the middle of the night. Sleeping bag comes off of me, and that very night after we ate the snake, I wake up and I can feel this thing laying across my chest, like this big around. And I managed to grab it with my left hand, and I threw it off of me. But as I threw it, I rolled with it, so I'm, I know I'm wrapped up with this thing somehow. But I managed to get it pinned down with my left hand, and then I uh, try to free my right arm so I can pin it down with two hands, but I can't move my right arm. And it's about this time I realize I've actually pinned down my own right arm, like this. <laughs> and and uh, my, uh, my arm was just, had fallen asleep and was across me like this, so, so there was no snake. And, uh, then it, and then, you know, then I have to like explain why I'm, and I don't even really speak the language at this point, right? So I'm kind of trying to explain like why I'm wrestling with myself on the ground. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, uh, um, you know, and all this like sounds really funny, but this is, this is, uh, I went back to my journals uh, this last summer, and I, I knew that I had been really sad in New Guinea, when I, at, when, mostly when I first arrived. And when I was looking back at my journals, I realized that I had actually been in a very dark place for about eight months. I, re I honestly had totally forgotten that. I thought that I would be, I knew I'd been in a dark place, but I thought it was like two months. And it was very transformative for me to go through all that, but but uh, it was eight months of deep sadness. And I, I remember this, um, I guess I had this, in, this revelation during that, that I realized that I thought that who I was was something inside of me that I projected outward. That you know, we all like craft our identities very carefully as we grow up. And then um, I thought that stayed with me and that I would just project that outward and I'd always be me. And when I got there, I realized that it's just as important, the people around you uh, reflect back to you who you are just as much as you project something outward. And um, that helped me understand a lot of things about how important community is and how important having strong relationships are. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, but I also had this moment where, uh, well, a couple things. One is that I, uh, I had this great moment where I was walking. That's not a really great moment. It's a terrible moment. But I was walking along this uh, ridge, uh, looks like this, and I remember actually looking at how beautiful it was and uh, realizing, you know, I'd, I'd been dreaming of this for a long time, you know, I'd, ever since I started having those big questions in anthropology class, I dreamed of being someplace like this. It was more beautiful than I could imagine, and, and but I, I, because it was beautiful, I was actually more sad, because I was feeling so sad, and then I'm looking out at this place where I knew I'd been wanted to be for so long, and it just made me even more sad. So I'm actually uh, getting so sad that it's making me physically weak, and I, um, and I just start to collapse. And I'm walking along this ridge, and I just collapse on this ridge, and I'm crying there. And these two guys who are walking behind me um, come up beside me. And by the time they get to me, they're crying too. And they don't even know what I'm crying about, but they're crying there with me. And I'm, like, I'm so amazed by that level of empathy that they showed in that moment. And, 
they, they said, why, uh, why are you crying? And I said, and the only thing I could think was that I, I miss my wife. So I said, I miss my wife. And they started laughing and laughing. They said, oh, we would never miss our wives. <laughs> they said, uh, they said, and then they said, oh, we miss our kids. And, uh, and this, this is actually them with their kids there. Uh, and, uh, and so then we're all crying there. And, um, but the amazing thing was that was the beginning of, uh, I had this really strong sense of connection. And because of that, uh, combined with, actually, I think a little bit, this destru- total destruction of myself, um, actually opened me up to learning and wonder and questions in ways that I had never really encountered before. There was actually something kind of awesome and special about destroying my old self and opening myself up to all these new ideas and a new way of being and all that kind of thing. And I, uh, I don't necessarily recommend that to undergrads, <laughs> but it's certainly, I think, a good lesson to recognize that a lot of times your barriers to learning are actually things you already know. Sometimes unlearning is the road forward to learning. So, um, but that was, that was important to me, and, that, and the, that sense of connection was important to me. Um, you know, what we're finding is just how important, when we talk about like deep learning, this, and so there's this distinction that's made between deep learning and superficial learning, uh, surface learning. And this deep learning, like when you're really in it, uh, typically, on, typically actually happens in a, with a sense of community, a sense of connection, a sense of like a sort of spirit of, of, of a pursuit of something, like a pursuit of knowledge or learning and so on. And, and that's important, and that, that sense of connection with one another. And what we find in, in our society today is, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing connections on the decline. Even at a time where we're more connected than ever, we find, for example, that, that there are studies now showing that empathy is on the decline. And empathy is actually a really interesting marker of, of wonder because you know, nobody's ever gone around and tried to figure out if wonder is on the decline because it's so hard to operationalize. But, but empathy is one where they have. And empathy is really the capacity to imagine your way into somebody else's perspective. And that is, in a way, a, a very strong indicator of wonder. Um, and so here, you know, we see empathy on the decline. And you think about back in New Guinea, why is it, why would it be so strong? Why were those guys crying with me on the side of that mountain? And you could say, well, for one, their lives are virtually unmediated. A lot of people immediately pick up on that, right? That they really share their lives. But I think it's but more than that, uh, they actually share everything. They share their deaths too. There's no sort of hiding from it. It's right there. So even while, while I was living there, I had to watch many people die. And I remember one day, you know, it was like Wednesday, we were playing soccer uh, with Joseph here. And then Friday, he was sick, so we were staying up late with him, just, you know, getting water for him, that kind of thing. And I remember really just thinking that whole night, like, oh, he's sick. It's not a big deal. He's sick. Um, and then just after midnight, he crosses this line, you know, that, that uh, unfathomable line from which you can't cross back, right? And I just remember how, thinking how big that gap was, like how, how he was just sick, you know, just, you know, five minutes ago, and now he's gone. And... Uh, I also remember having this tremendous sense of frailty and vulnerability, but also recognizing that I shared it with everybody around me. Like, there was almost, there was actually like a tremendous sense of connection that comes out of that. And I think that's really the birthplace of empathy is that shared sense of vulnerability. And uh, so here you, you see that. And in, in our society, we've actually used these technologies to actually close ourselves off from that sense of vulnerability. So we've used our technologies, starting with a car even, for example, just to put ourselves into these boxes and then we shop in boxes where we don't know the people that are selling us the stuff or where the stuff came from. And then we look back into our culture through these boxes. And over time, we've just you know, moved into more boxes, shopped in bigger boxes and looked through these boxes. So you know, Robert Putnam is famously able to say by the year 2000 that we're bowling alone, that all signs of American community are on the decline. Um, there's other indicators of this, for example, or other stories about this. This is Living de Couture calls it the capsular civilization, that we uh, put ourselves in, in uh, boxes, and we live in boxes, and we put ourselves in other boxes, the car, to get to the next box. And all the while, we're kind of disconnected from the world around us. And this has really profound implications for how we explore the world and how our kids grow up. 
So for example, this is uh, Peter White who grew up in the 1950s, and he talks about how when he was growing up in the 1950s, he was actually encouraged to run around his neighborhood uh, completely unsupervised, even as a very small child. And then he learned to ride a bike later on so he could try to go a little bit farther. And then when he got to be a teenager, he started hitchhiking up to 100 miles a day and then come back, he'd be back by that night. And Peter White did all of that in the 1950s, even though he's blind. And then you think back to everything I just said and you realize his, kid, his parents were letting him run around the neighborhood unsupervised. He learned to ride a bike and he had the scars to prove it, but he was going to do it because everybody else was doing it. And then he put his trust in a stranger that he couldn't see to take him someplace 100 miles away and then come back by that night. That's a level of public trust that we just don't have today. Um, in fact, some preliminary studies of space, how far kids roam, show that kids are roaming as little as 11% of the area that their parents roamed, and that trend has held up for several generations. So <laughs> um, and I don't, this is an interesting just comparison. This is a friend of mine in New Guinea. Um, that's a real knife. And I don't know if it's <laughs> the difference. <laughs> and you know, what does this have to do with wonder? Well, what it has to do with wonder is like, if you think about what wonder is, wonder is this capacity to live with questions. Questions, if you just like think about what a question is, because a question really is one of the most amazing things that a human does. Um, first off, when you like really have a question in mind and you're pursuing a question, there is a sense of purpose. There's a sense of, uh, I mean, I guess there's the word quest right in the word question, right? There is like a sense of quest. The great questions actually lead us to just more questions. You find a few answers, but those answers become the framework for the next question. And that's the beauty of what we do in higher ed. It's the beauty of science, it's the beauty of any pursuit. So that's, that's one element of it. The second element I'd mention is this capacity to connect us, that even in posing a question, you're opening yourself up to connections, intellectual connections, connections to new ideas, but also connections to each other. This capacity to you know, actually frame a question and pose it to another person is to invite them into your thought process, which is just really a mind-blowing thing that we can do that at all. And then the last thing I'll mention about a question, this is a, 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 a little bit of speculation here, but I think it's very interesting that, that in, uh, there about, there's just over 6,000 languages in the world. In all of them except about 70, uh, it's been noted that you, when you ask a question, you raise your intonation. Somewhere in that phrase, you raise your intonation. And uh, John Ohala, a linguist out of Berkeley, suggests this might have something to do with the universal frequency code, that you raise your pitch when you want to invite people in and, and be, express vulnerability, and you lower your pitch when you want people to back off. So uh, you can see this in, they found like 70 mammals in which this is true, and several, uh, and most birds also do this, where, so that there's a growl, right? The, the, the dog growls at you to back off, but it'll do a little, <laughs> have you come in? Now, that, this, is, this is obviously speculation, but I, I think it's interesting though, this sense of vulnerability we all feel when we ask a question. And perhaps it is encoded in that rising intonation, but it's certainly, I think, a wonderful thing in the way that we make ourselves a little bit smaller when we ask a question in order to invite people in and open ourselves up and sort of humbly invite the world in to learn something new. So those are, the, I think, really the three elements of a question, that it does have this sense of purpose, a quest to it, it opens us up to others, invites connections, and then it also, we have to embrace our vulnerability to even ask a question. It is risky, it's hard to ask a question, uh, and that's why we have to uh, have that courage to do it. Um, what we see in our society, though, is a sort of numbing process. Um, Brene Brown has said that we are, we are the most addicted, medicated, obese, and debt, and busy adult cohort in human history. She says these are ways of numbing ourselves, and you cannot numb emotions selectively, which is to say you can't numb yourself to the possibility of pain and rejection without also numbing yourself to the possibilities of joy and connection. So where are we at with our schools then? Um, I think when we look at what it's like to grow up today, there's something like what you might call the vicious cycle of the age of whatever, which is to say we live in a world of tremendous choice and tremendous pressure to do all kinds of things. I've been talking to faculty all day and I hear a lot about 
students at Cornell and how they have to populate their CVs with all kinds of things. And I see some of the students here and, and congratulations, you guys populated your CVs amazingly well. Like that's, and it's really hard. Like that's, that's gotta be hard to do. And, but it is like this world in which we feel, it, you can start to feel overwhelmed and a little bit uh, displaced, like you're kind of in too many places at once. And this is just the nature of the world. The nature of the world today is a world of tremendous choice, tremendous choice about who you're going to be and what you're going to do and, and so on. Um, in that world, there, of course, the primary occupation of all of us is to try to find ourselves, to try to figure out who we are. In the process of doing so, in this world of infinite choice, a very common reaction is to defend any choices that you make, to really grab onto them and possibly even celebrate them. And so some people, there's a lot of books out now about the narcissism epidemic and things like that. I don't really buy into that. I don't think people are so narcissistic. I think it's just a function of, our, of a sort of oversaturated society. So we defend or celebrate ourselves we are all trying to be different from each other to find our own unique path, and that means that we're ultimately going to lead to some fragmentation. Uh, if you're interested in more of the philosophy behind this, this is kind of cribbing off of Charles Taylor's uh, work. And uh, so we end up with more fragmentation, more uh, uh, just no people do not share the same ideas, ideals, values, and so on. Um, we end up with more complexity then. And ultimately, all this complexity just sort of cycles back, and we end up feeling this loss of certainty, uh, meaning, and power, and we kind of throw our hands up and say, whatever. Uh, when you look at our schools and how they're helping us deal with this situation, uh, you can be, become a little bit disappointed. This is a part of a valedictorian speech from a girl in Georgia. So she's a valedictorian, the type of student who would come to Cornell. Um, in her valedictorian speech, she says, this is Erica Goldson, she says, I wonder, why did I even want this position? Sure, I earned it, but what will come of it? When I leave educational institutionalism, will I be forever lost? I have no clue about what I want to do with my life. I have no interest because I, sh I saw every subject of study as work, and I excelled at every subject just for the purpose of excelling, not learning. And quite frankly, now I'm scared. That's certainly a sentiment shared uh, not only among my students but uh, I myself had that same sense at one point that there's really uh, no sense of purpose or quest and so then you come up to the university and you're faced with this situation um, so what we this is just you know you walk into these huge lecture halls and what we did in this video is we just tried to think about what the walls are saying you know that if students learn what they do we're wondering, what are they learning when they're sitting here? And of course, one of the things they're learning is that the information is up at the front of the room, that they should, you know, obey the authority, so to speak, follow along. And of course, this isn't really the message we'd want to be sending to make sort of effective uh, learners of somebody. So what we did in this video is we just, um, I just started a Google Doc and I invited all the students in the class to just start editing with me. And so this is what it looked like as we were editing it. And you can see the, the document just keeps growing as more students pitch in. And there's a few blanks there. Those are blanks where we had to survey ourselves to get the data we wanted for it. But this is basically the script for the video you're watching. And so this is you know mostly first and second years. And you can see their, the types of things that they're pointing out. So you can watch the rest of that on YouTube. I won't share the whole thing there with you. But um, a few observations, for example, <laughs> like this one. Um, that, this one is interesting to me because really this is the collision of two great knowledge machines, the university and this universe of three billion people connecting and collaborating in new ways. And yet it's coming into our universities as a distraction device. And I think that's a real shame. Here's another student, uh, her little um, I am popped up just as she showed this, so this is definitely something that's happening a lot. Um, and then, you know, this one I really feel like is like a 74% failure rate on our part, uh, and so on. So you saw all those. Uh, we also did this exercise where we really tried to lay this out. What does it mean? What is the basic like epistemology that's here? And one of the we realized was that 
most students were defining learning as acquiring information, which is actually a very low level form of learning. That's all about, that's a world of where it's all about answers. It's not about questions. They found that uh, the walls were saying that information is scarce, and yet information is all around us. They had trust authority, that the walls say that you should trust authority for good, in, good information, that authorized information is beyond discussion, so the chairs don't turn toward one another. There's virtually no discussion in the class. And ultimately, they should obey the authority and follow along. And this is really not even the worst of it, because even in a good situation, as David Hestings figured out, he, he's a physics professor out in Arizona, and what he, what he found among his students was that you know, things were going just fine. He had this class, and his physics students were averaging about 80% on his exams, and that's just fine. You know, that's just the way things are. Okay, let's, you know, year after year it rolls on, everything's fine. And then one of his colleagues developed this thing called a force concept inventory, which uh, is a fancy way of saying a, a different kind of physics test, which measured whether or not they understood the concepts, not whether or not they could take a physics exam. And uh, the, the questions were things like this, like two metal balls are the same size, but one weighs twice as much as the other, and they'll drop from a two-story building at the same instant, which one will reach the ground first? And it turns out, uh, on average, these students who were getting 80% in the class were only getting 40% on this exam. And the reason why, as David Hestines looked at it, he said, oh, the problem here is that you don't have any numbers in there. So the students don't know which formula to plug in because they're not able to like, identify what kind of problem this is. Which is to say the students were actually learning, they were doing fine, they were, they were learning how to take a physics class. And when you, what you learn in a physics class is that you'll get some word problems, but they will be some indicators there. You don't even have to read the problem. You just look for the, the units, and then you know which, which formula uses those units, and you plug it in. And this is just you know, sort of a routine expertise that's developed, not what's called an adaptive expertise, where you can actually solve a real problem. So um, Eric Mazur saw this. He's over at Harvard, and uh, he said, well, that might be true in Arizona, but I'm at Harvard. And uh, <laughs> so he gave, he gave his students this inventory this test, and his students also did very poorly on it. So he realized something had to change. So what can we do? Like, what, I mean, even in the best situation here where students are achieving well, they're in many cases just sort of learning how to take a class. They're not actually learning deep concepts. They're not learning anything, uh, and they're certainly not asking big questions that are going to lead their lives on interesting pursuits. So let me just share with you a few ideas, and this is all very you know, up in the air, I'm changing things all the time, but these are just a few things that I do. Uh, also some things that some of my colleagues have done that are interesting. So here's my big class. I've, this is my small class, 200 people. Um, I have another one, 400. And what we do is, since this is the study of all humans in all times and all places, um, the students are allowed to become experts on anywhere in the world. So all these students, like, uh, we still like have traditional classes, you know, with, uh, very inspirational lectures and, <laughs> and so on. Um, but the, uh, a lot of the projects that are going on in the background of the class are these students learning about these different places in the world and they, they can aggregate all their knowledge on this, this big wiki. We use a wiki, we use all different kinds of whatever technology we want for that year. And they just, they gather all this information about all these different places and so on. Um, and then things get really interesting because as they're gathering all this information, a lot of questions start to emerge. And what we really want to do is aggregate the questions. And typically, the big questions that are emerging are things like this. Basically, a bunch of students start to realize that, hey, you know, the place where I live is very impoverished, or the place where I'm studying. Uh, why is it 1.3 billion people are living on less than a dollar a day, or 3 billion on less than $2 a day? Why are 800 million undernourished? Why are 27,000 children dying of poverty today? And the big question becomes why. This becomes the, the organizing question of the class. It's like, why is this happening? And the beauty of this question, actually, is it's one of those big questions that, that has a lot of different answers, a lot of different perspectives. And what we do to sort of analyze those different perspectives is we create a simulation. And the students actually help create the simulation. You can see here, uh, this is just the opening of a Google Doc where a number of options are laid out, and then students uh, can sort of vote on the different options until we reach a consensus about how this, this thing is gonna work. And this is how it worked. Uh, this is in the spring last year. Uh, we've got all the students, they, they get a takeover campus. This just takes an hour. This is just an hour long simulation. One, some groups get marshmallows, some get straws, and some gets rubber bands. And then they trade these things to simulate 
indigenous trade networks, and then they can go hunting uh, with their little marshmallow-tipped arrows um, and the rubber bands. <laughs> and that, so they score points by shooting at these flags, which is like going hunting. But then these groups, they sort of represent uh, more powerful countries that were starting to emerge. And so they get marshmallow guns, which are just PVC pipe. And if you get hit by a marshmallow, you have to freeze for 100 seconds. And then they can come in and colonize your land and all that kind of stuff, right? And these people want to create, they're looking for marshmallow necklaces. So they have to control the rubber bands, the straws, and the marshmallows. So they can put the marshmallows on the straws, which then go on the rubber bands, as you'll see here, to create these necklaces. And all this looks kind of crazy, right? I know. <laughs> I'm going to get to the learning outcome soon. <laughs> so then we have a straw shortage because people have exhausted resources. There's, there's one more group. Dang. What do we got for straws up on the hill? They're out too. What's that? You guys want to go with them? You're desperate? You need a job? <laughs> what happened here? So we're, I got to take you to the They were paid something? They were, they paid us commercials to have part of our company. Oh, okay. Slave trade essentially is going to cross right here. But these people have actually been bought and they're coming over to work. What's happening here is that the sort of um, colonizing powers have gone to war with each other as the global resource has gone into decline. So here's the final phase here. Goodness, look at this. Everything is shut down. The world is coming to an end. There are no resources left. Okay, so that just took an hour, right? That's just like an hour little thing that we do. Um, but the beauty of this is they spent a lot of time brainstorming like, and looking at different theories and how to apply them to create this game. And then the game doesn't match world history exactly. It does a little bit, but not completely. So now we've got this starting place to discuss, okay, what, what, um, what worked, what didn't, and how does that relate to these theories that we've been learning and so on. The beauty of this, though, for me, though, is the way that it shifts the whole emphasis of the class. For one, we feel like a community. We feel uh, more connected to each other. More importantly, though, they stop asking what's going to be on this test, because <laughs> that doesn't matter. What really matters is what's going to be on this test. There's a sense of, like, what do we need to know for this test, the test of our lives? Like these, they, it puts them in touch with global problems in a way that they hadn't been in touch with them before and gets them thinking about them. And it also gets them thinking about them in a playful way, which I actually think is very important. Um, there's an interesting thing about play, and it's actually a very important, I think, way to approach the world. I don't mean play in the sense of not taking things seriously, but I mean being playful and able to entertain different ideas and so on. Because it turns out that purpose, this sense of purpose, lends itself really well to a sense of play. And there are a lot of things that we know about play. One is that humans have learned through play you know, for, for most of our history. And one of the things that happens in play, if you just think about what happens in a sandlot, like a sandlot baseball, informal baseball, or something, or any kind of informal game anywhere, one is that the people playing have a sense of co-ownership, that there's no clear owner of this, that we all have a say in what's happening here. There's then a sense of connection and a sense of trust. And what happens then is that people have a certain freedom to take chances. And they have this certain uh, amount of courage to take chances in this playful way. And that increases novelty, which ultimately elevates engagement, which increases that sense of buy-in, that sense of co-ownership. And so it creates this sort of ongoing cycle. And there's a lot of lessons you can learn from play. 
that are very important that aren't taught very well in a traditional classroom. For example, play actually elevates and rewards beginners. People relax a little bit more, they, they take chances, and they perform better, while also challenging people at all levels. Uh, you know, the farther you get into a subject, the farther you study something, the more you really need to be playful, and yet we tend to shut down as we get, as we get farther along in our studies because it feels a little bit riskier to take a chance on something. So, but if you can maintain that sort of playful mindset, it can really open you up to some different things. It also, play builds and broadens perspectives. It allows you to entertain all these different kinds of ideas and just uh, at least for a moment to, to consider them. It also builds empathy. Um, if you think about what happens in a playground, the play will stop if you don't have empathy for the person you're playing with. You have to constantly be monitoring how they're feeling and what they're thinking and adapting the play, adapting the structure of the play to them, otherwise they'll just stop playing. And so the, what you find then are structures and rules that are arbitrary and changeable. Ultimately you find that conflict is normal, it happens all the time when we play, but it can be resolved. And that failure is normal and that can be overcome. These are all lessons that actually aren't taught very well at all in a typical classroom. In fact, they're most typical classrooms usually the opposite of that. And it ties in really well with Carol Dweck's really great research on fixed versus growth mindsets, which, you know, a growth mindset is in many ways a playful mindset. She did this study where um, she's done many studies that indicate that uh, your capacity to learn is tremendously enhanced by having a growth mindset, which a growth mindset is one in which you say, which you understand that, that you can actually become better at whatever it is that you're struggling with, you can learn, that, you can, that your capacity to learn can change. Uh, all these different types of things are changeable. Uh, whereas if you have a fixed mindset where you just say, you know, I'm stupid and that's why I got a bad grade, then you're learn, you actually learn less and over time your grades go down. And uh, what she, she, this is pretty amazing stuff, but she pointed out, for example, she did a study where she had students take a really, really hard exam, and they did terrible on it, like you would expect. And then after the exam, she said, uh, she allowed people to see a, another student's exam. She said, she said, uh, if you'd like to see another student's exam, you can see one. And the people with a growth mindset, almost universally, wanted to see a student's exam who had done better than them, of course, right? Because they want to learn from this student who did better than them so they could figure out what the right answers are. The students who had a fixed mindset actually wanted to see a student exam that had done worse than them just so they could feel better about themselves. And so you can see like the difference there. The growth mindset person is actually open to learning and it really helps to have a kind of playful mind about these things because learning is in a sense playful and, and you want to be able to sort of playfully devour as much information and knowledge as you can and if you're really focused on this idea of feeling stupid or feeling bad you're not going to get there and of course one way to facilitate this is to have strong connections with one another um, and have a sense of community around you. Parker Palmer envisions that sort of ideal learning environment is something more like this and less like this uh, typically, we think of learning as, you know, you have this object to be learned that's delivered by the experts to the amateurs. This is a world of answers. Uh, but what he suggests is that we think about learning instead like this, that there is this living subject that we're all asking questions about, that, that is alive and always changing, and that we, as co-knowers, are engaging with one another and the subject itself, and that, and, and that creates this, this richness to the experience. That's kind of what uh, Eric Mazur figured out. He figured out that by using, he started using clickers in his classroom, but not in the typical way you would imagine. A lot of people use clickers to measure simple information retrieval. They ask a question and see how many students understood the information. Uh, he did it in a much more interesting way. He would ask a complex physics question and get these uh, sort of bimodal distributions where uh, half the students would answer one thing and half the students would answer another. And then he simply just has people talk to each other for 10 minutes, and 10 minutes later, everybody in the room has the right answer. And not only that, their capacity for understanding the concept is greatly increased because the best teacher in the room turned out to be the person who just learned it. That person who has just recently wrestled with the concept turns out to be the best teacher around. And so these types of classrooms are emerging all over. This is the University of Minnesota. This is MIT. These are 
large classrooms, place, these, are, these are rooms that maybe used to look like this, are being transformed into rooms like this. And it doesn't really matter the room because you can do all kinds of amazing things once you decide that you're all in it together, that you want to collaborate with one another and do something interesting. I often think of my classes as um, trying to do some, some real and relevant project that engages the, the world beyond the classroom. And it elevates the sense of engagement, elevates the sense of purpose. This is a class, uh, this is a uh, landscape architecture class that we collaborated with. And what we did was, these are all landscape architecture students who have a great deal of knowledge about uh, how, the, how the built environment affects human behavior. And so we decided to leverage all of that knowledge they were getting in the classes. And what we did was we canceled classes for two days and they spent 48 hours working on a single project together. And what they did was, the first thing they did is they went all over our town, which is about 50,000 people, and they mapped the whole town based on how bikeable different streets were. So they measured uh, traffic volume, curb lane width, um, smoothness of the road, all, slope of the road, all these things that matter for bikeability. And we're, and we're able then to map all the bike parking and so on. And ultimately, we were able to create this map that where the green roads are very bikeable and the red roads are not bikeable at all. And then there's some in between as well. And what you ended up with was this, this map that, that uh, shows that Manhattan, Kansas was kind of made up of these little islands where it was very bikeable within these islands, within these neighborhoods, but there was no connection between them. And so that was a wonderful design problem. So they spent the next 24 hours designing solutions to those problems and then presented their solutions to, the, they, we invited in the city commission, the mayor, uh, the bicycle advisory committee, and uh, ultimately rally forth, not a million new ideas. I don't know where the, <laughs> where the writer came up with that, but, um, but we did have a lot of ideas and we were able to aggregate those over the next year. Uh, we created a new strategic plan for um, bicycle infrastructure and the commissioner supported it. Uh, this is very hard to do in, uh, uh, it was a Tea Party commission, so it was really uh, wonderful to get their support. And we were able to, to have some of the first bicycle boulevards in the state and ultimately became a bicycle friendly community, which is something that nobody could ever imagine you know, five years ago when we started that project. And that was just like two days of coming together to apply our knowledge to something real. And what comes out of that is the students have a sense of empowerment, a sense of connection to their community, a sense that they really can do something. So the last thing I want to talk about is this project. This is a, a project, and the reason why I'm talking about this one is because this sense of wonder is greatly enhanced when you really put yourself on the line in some significant way. So what we did in this class is we actually moved into a retirement community and they gave us an apartment. And this is like a retirement community that functions as a nursing home uh, slash retirement community. It's a continuing care retirement community. And um, this is a class where it's just an anthropology methods class, right? You're supposed to learn methods of anthropology. And I thought, well, what better way to learn math methods of anthropology than to move in to a village and actually do anthropology. So we moved into this retirement community. Um, we, you can see instead of a syllabus, we have a schedule. We, it's like a research schedule. Any student could edit this at any time, uh, which I thought was really important to give that sense of that we're all working on this together. We also did a lot of collective readings where we had a lot of literature to cover and not very much time. So we would use, this is Etherpad, you can use Google Docs for this. We would go to the library as a group and we would, we would be there for like long, long hours, and we would just be all over the library reading whatever we could find that was relevant to our project and then sharing it on this, uh, summarizing what we were reading on this huge document. And this, the, the reading for the week was just read everything you can, including the summaries that other people have read. So we're able to come in the class the next week, instead of having, say, read one or two articles and discuss one or two articles, we've all read maybe five articles each. And collectively, we've read like 100 articles and we get to discuss from a more affirmative stance, not just like a critical stance of what's wrong with this article, which is kind of a typical way of going about it, but instead like what's rich in the literature right now? Where are the holes? Where are the big questions? And that kind of thing. It's a very rich discussion. And then, you know, there's the whole process of doing the research itself in which we actually had to build our own computers. We built our own rigs. We set up our little studio. We don't have any money. So, you know, like this is like a, a light fixture that 
he found on campus. I won't, I won't know how he found it on campus, but <laughs> that's, this is how we rolled. You know, it was all just whatever we could find. And then we set up this little studio. We start practicing on ourselves. And then we bring in people. And it's a good thing we were practicing, right? You know, this. <laughs> and uh, we just had this great experience. But uh, you know, just to show you how intense this is, students started making their own assignments for themselves because each student has their own little project that weaves into the larger project. They were actually assigning themselves four books over five weeks, which was uh, a level of reading. I've never, been, I've never been able to get away with that much assigning that much reading. But when they're doing it for themselves, they're all doing it. They're all assigning themselves four books in five weeks, four books in five weeks. This is one of the most beautiful ones I, I really liked. This is a student who's in this class. Uh, on a day I couldn't be there, I had a, a family emergency, so I texted them real quick. I couldn't be there. And they said, this is what she wrote in her blog. She says, we put a lot of good thoughts together today in class. It's one of the sweetest class periods I think I've ever been a part of. No teacher. <laughs> she says, crazy, right? It was actually really sweet. We had the whiteboards cover of spiderweb diagrams, lists and connections. The ideas were all posing. Um, it's just beautiful stuff. And then at the end, it's my favorite. She says, um, we're always being shaped, always learning. What is learning? I'm learning right now, processing, learning how to communicate my thoughts, typing speed increasing. She's having this moment of transformation. Just as a student, I've talked to her about this since then. This is a student who always did fine in classes, you know, typical sort of uh, A or high B student. And, but she was just kind of being a strategic learner. She hadn't gotten into that level of really being in it. And this is how she described it. She says, it was like I was really in it. And, and, and she had this experience of what it's like to be in it. And it's stayed with her uh, ever since. But you know, the last piece of this is this reality that when you're in it, you're in it, like all of you is in it. And it's not just a cognitive process anymore. And that process that we talked about moving from this world of answers to ambiguity is one that your whole self goes through. It's not just a cognitive thing. So here, you know, all kinds of your pa things about your past will come to play. This is uh, one of my students who is living in the retirement community, and he had to really wrestle uh, with the death of his own grandfather, who had died in a tornado just two years before that. And he was actually, this is, this is his town uh, after that tornado. And then we had another student who was studying, she wanted to study death in, uh, um, and people's attitudes towards death in the retirement community. And then she went off to run the Boston Marathon. And you guys remember what happened at the Boston Marathon. Um, she was just like 200 feet away from the explosion. And so she was really shook up by that. And at the same time, you know, here she was studying death because she thought this is among, among people who really have to face death. And then she really felt like she had to face it. Um, and, you know, that's the thing is that you just don't, get through this stuff alone. You don't get from, these are all scenes from the documentary that we made, but you just don't get from these along this journey without connecting with other people. So let me just wrap this up then. The, the main idea here is that, um, you know, we have this vicious cycle, but that you can actually shift the whole cycle. Instead of, if you think of it instead of searching for yourself, but instead realizing this sense of, shared vulnerability, sense of connection, and so on, there's this realization that we collectively can make the world, that we co-create the world. This, instead of defending and celebrating yourself, you end up embracing the sense of vulnerability. Once you start embracing vulnerability, the fragmentation doesn't look like fragmentation. It looks like a rich diversity. It looks like a, a rich space from which you can connect with other people, invite connections with all kinds of different people. The complexity doesn't look like complexity, but more like a symphony that you can join in. And you no longer feel a loss of certainty, meaning, and power, but you, you start to celebrate what is all around you. There is a sense of wonder uh, in celebrating what's around you, but also pursuing what's possible, recognizing that, that there's more to be done. And so you don't just have a sense of whatever, throwing your hands up, but instead a sense of we can do whatever, we can uh, do, do whatever by whatever means possible, whatever, by whatever means necessary, we can, we can do this. I want to give you one final scene to give you a sense of what I mean by this. And this is, because uh, I know we've all been in a state of wonder before. And I want to give you an image of what it looks like so you can remind yourself and maybe try to get back to it and help our students get there. Um, this is uh, in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, where it never snows. And then it did. And so all these people are kind of stuck out in this. And 
You see, though, there's not a retreat here, right? There's an embrace. Uh, nobody's bundling up. Nobody's, you know, zipping up their coats. And nobody's running into the stores. They're all running out of them. And that, to me, is what wonder is really all about, right? There's like this en engagement of the world, even if it's uncomfortable. And there's a sense of like connection with each other. And there's really the two sides of wonder that I think feed into each other. There's the side of wonder that just allows you to have this sense of awe uh, that, so that even like a, a walk can feel enchanted, right? So there's this sense of awe where you're celebrating the world and so on. But then there's, there, there's a moment where that sense of awe and fascination turns to investigation. Like that, that it's not just about being in wonder, but wondering about things. And to me, that's the joy of higher ed, right? That we get to not only experience the wonder of the world, but then wonder about it. And those things feed into each other. The, the answers we get while we're wondering things don't shut us off from more wonder. They actually open us up. And, you know, we can start to see connections where we never saw connections before. And my favorite part about it all is just that everything starts to matter. Like little things start to matter. And in that sense, we really do become, you know, like kids again. It's this ever renewing process. This is the best we can hope for our students is to give them that gift of that ever renewing process of wonder. And it's something that can last forever. This is actually, you know, research has shown that, that it's one of the most changeable personality traits. So that if you're not in wonder now, if you don't have that sense of curiosity and wonder, it is something that you can change. Uh, you should have a growth mindset about that because you actually can transform that part of yourself. And, uh, and there's really nothing more important that you could do, in my opinion. So that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>